So the next talk will be a contributed talk from David Bird on sparse Gaussian process inference. Oh. Yes. Well, I mean, the, to the topic of the, the, the title of the paper is Explicit Rate of Convergence for Sparse Variational Inference in Gaussian Process Regressions. So let's uh, welcome Dave. So, uh, yeah, hi, I'm David Burt, and this uh, was work done with uh, R.R. Mason and Mark Vanderwell. And um, so we do obtain kind of explicit bounds on the KL divergence um, on when we do sparse Gaussian process inference, and, and uh, sparse in the sense that the number of inducing uh, features used is much less than the amount of data. Um, and then we kind of Kind of in this talk, I'll focus a lot on uh, what that says about how many inducing features we really need to use when we uh, perform sparse uh, variational inference. Okay, so I'll begin by kind of briefly introducing um, the the problem, and then talk about some of the standard bounds on the marginal likelihood and in, in understanding the KL divergence. And then um, I'll introduce eigenfunction inducing features, which are an example of an inner domain uh, inducing feature, and use these to drive the bounds uh, that we prove on the KL divergence, and then uh, uh, kind of get to what this means about how many features we actually need to use. <clears throat> right, so uh, the standard kind of setup for Gaussian process inference is that we put a prior over directly over functions uh, in, instead of parameterizing it, and this lets us perform non-parametric Bayesian inference. We can get uh, a nice posterior over functions, we can draw samples from those functions, and get good estimates of it. The problem is it tends to scale cubically in the amount of data, uh, so we can't really apply this to large data sets. So commonly, we do sparse variational inference, and the idea here is that we let the posterior only depend on m uh, inducing, inducing points, usually. Um, we'll, we'll use a slightly more general framework later, but, um, and and then we can move these, uh, these points around and uh, try to minimize the KL divergence between an approximation of posterior and the full posterior. And as we increase M, we have to do uh, more computation, but we get a, a better approximation. So here we can see uh, in the upper right-hand corner at three is M. And so, oh, uh, so we can see that as we increase M, we kind of get more posterior we might expect. Uh, but there's, there's some computational trade-off there. Right, so the main question we're gonna try to get to in this talk is how many, uh, how large do we really need to take in? So how many inducing points do we really need uh, to be sure that our sparse approximation is really close to the full model? And it's known that if we use standard inducing points and we place them exactly where the data was, then uh, we can take n equals n, but in that case we don't really get any computational benefit. So we want to say something kind of in the sparse regime. Right, so we're gonna approach kind of what it means to have a good approximation by proving bounds on the KL divergence uh, between uh, the variational <coughs> approximation and the, the true posterior. Um, and we'll prove bounds that hold with high probability kind of for large n, where we assume the, the training inputs, so these are the, the x variables, <coughs> draw an IID from some probability distribution. And in, in a separate work we introduced um, the, these eigenfunction inducing features, so we're an example of an inner domain feature. So basically, instead of putting down points and using these for sparse inference, we uh, we take uh, integral of a function against some, uh, an integral of a process against some function. And the really special property about these these inducing features is they have a diagonal covariance matrix, so so they're orthogonal, and that's going to help us prove these bounds. It also has some nice computational benefits. Uh, which we explore in, in different work. Right, so first we have that for Gaussian process regression, the full log marginal likelihood is just the log of this normal <laughs> density, and it depends on the, the, this matrix KFF, which is formed by looking at the covariance of the data points, and the inversion of this matrix is the main bottleneck. Uh, so in sparse uh, variational inference, um, we replace KFF by this matrix QFF, which is basically a rank M approximation to this matrix. In order to perform inference now, we just need to invert a rank M matrix, so, so that's less uh, computationally costly. And um, kind of the, the elbow which comes out of 
this framework uh, looks a lot like the full marginal likelihood, except we've replaced KFF by this rank M approximation. And we also have this term, which comes from kind of the, the error in the trace uh, for making this approximation. And importantly, kind of on a theoretical level, we know that the gap between these two is a KL divergence from the variational approximation to the full posterior process. So if we want to bound this KL divergence, we need to bound this, this gap. Um, but the, the full likelihood depends on the empirical covariance matrix. And that's a bit hard to get a handle on. Um, so we look instead at this upper bound, uh, which is already in the literature. And now this only depends on our rank M matrix and on this error in trace norm. And so that makes it a little easier for comparison. So we'll actually bound um, the, the gap between this upper bound and the lower bound. And clearly, since uh, the likelihood is between these two, that'll also give us a bound on the KL divergence. Right, so um, a bit of a uh, if you kind of just subtract those two uh, bounds and then manipulate matrices sum, you get that the KL divergence is upper bounded by this error in the, the trace of this matrix, plus this term, which, which should be roughly, um, should roughly scale linearly with the amount of data we have, because our, uh, our observation outputs should, should scale linearly, um, assuming that it's not getting bigger kind of as the, the size of the output isn't getting bigger as we go. Right, so if we want to show that the KL divergence is going to tend to zero with, uh, as n gets big, we need to pick n as some function of n, uh, so that this, this error in trace is going to be little o of 1 over n. Right, so um, if, if we recall what the trace term is, uh, basically if we look at the second term, this, this QFF matrix, um, it's, uh, if we were to just subsample columns of the uh, initial matrix, then this rank M approximation would be a Nyström approximation. Um, so then our goal would be to bound the, the trace error of a rank M Nyström approximation to a, a rank M matrix. And there are bounds in the literature on this, and this is something we're currently looking at. They tend to depend really heavily on, on kind of the, the covariance matrix being well behaved, and in particular on something called uh, matrix coherence, which basically says that the <coughs> values are relatively homogeneous. Um, and kind of the naive thing to do would just be write down what the entries in this rank F matrix are, but we have this big matrix inverse, and um, that, that kind of makes that difficult. So instead, uh, we're going to define an inner domain feature which makes that uh, that cross covariance or the the covariance matrix between the features, the identity matrix, and then that will just go away. Uh, before doing that, um, we're going to talk about this this linear operator, um, which I'll refer to the covariance operator, and it's associated both to the kernel and some input measure uh, row, and basically. Um, the, the kind of intuitive thing to think of is that as we get a lot of data, if the data is coming uh, IID from the measure row, then uh, the, the empirical covariance matrix is, is converging to this operator. Um, and for a squared exponential kernel, we can actually write down what, this, uh, what the spectrum of this operator looks like if the data is normally distributed. And in that case, the eigenvalues decay exponentially. So that's kind of the, the quintessential example in what we, we prove things for. Um, right, so you can see that uh, this was, I think, this data set only had 200 data, data points, but you can see already the operate, uh, the eigenvalues mm -hmm. of the empirical covariance matrix line up pretty well with the, the theoretical eigenvalues. And this is on a, a long linear scale, which is why that looks. Right, so we define the, these inducing features in terms of that covariance operator now defined with respect to some measure mu and whatever kernel we're trying to approximate. And they're basically just an integral of the process against the eigenfunctions of this operator with uh, some rescaling from the eigenvalues. And um, basically all the same arguments that are used for standard inducing points uh, just carry over directly when we use interdomain inducing features. So, what we need to do now is compute these matrices 
uh, of the covariance between the features and the, the data points and the features and each other. Right, so the first one is, is relatively straightforward. Um, we write out the, the double integral, which is the, the covariance, and that expected value is just, uh, we recognize it as a kernel. We use the fact that these are eigenfunctions of the, the kernel with respect to its measure mu, the, um, and then we use the orthogonality of eigenfunctions. And then we just get that that's always either one or zero, and we have the identity matrix as promised. Right, and then we can just use the eigenfunction property here, and we can also write down the entries in KUF, and we'll need this uh, covariance later. So um, Mercer's theorem tells us that we can write out uh, our kernel as an infinite sum, which, looks, which is essentially an inner product of <coughs> the functions of this covariance operator, um, and uh, times the, the eigenvalues. And if we just multiply out these two matrix, we get something which looks very similar, but now it's a, a truncated version of the sum coming from Mercer's theorem. So um, now we can start to talk about the trace. And, and in order to do that, we just subtract these two terms. And since we're, we're, we're on the diagonal, uh, we have the eigenfunction squared uh, times the eigenvalues, and we just have the tail of the sum. Right, so kind of naively, the first thing to do is um, to look at the expected value of the, of the entries along the trace. And if we assume that the data now comes from the same distribution we used in defining the features, well, then this is just a Monte Carlo estimate. Uh, well, if we were to write out the trace, it would just be a Monte Carlo estimate of, um, of its inner integral. So, so at least an expectation we get that entries along the trace look like the, the sum of, uh, the tail of the sum of eigenvalues. Um, so so we, we can say that at least one over n times the trace tends to, tends to this, and um, kind of, we have, to, we have to prove then still that the eigenfunctions are well enough behaved so that, that this estimator actually converges, but we can, we can do that, and that's kind of a, more of a technical detail. Um, so, if we look at the squared exponential kernel, um, as, as I kind of noted earlier, the, um, the eigenvalues decay exponentially. So we get um, we get this uh, exponentially decaying bound on the trace. Again, these are on a log linear scale, um, and you, we can see that it's actually quite tight. So this is this bound actually is is an expectation and not holding it uh, necessarily with high probability or something like that. Um, and we similarly get a bound on the KL divergence, which, which decays rapidly, at least as you go out. So um, it's kind of, it's not a very useful bound for maybe 40 features in this example, but once you get to 50 or 60, you can say that you have a really good approximation to your posterior. Right, so, so kind of uh, the main theorem we prove in terms of the number of features needed is that if your goal is to approximate a squared exponential kernel, and the data is drop, comes IID from some normal distribution. Um, then if you kind of find eigenfunction inducing features it, with the right variance, um, you just need some constant times the log of an uh, amount of data you have, and you, you can get kind of this, this epsilon delta where your KL divergence is small with high probability. And, and kind of I've saved everything for, for one dimensional data, but if you assume the data is additive or um, or your kernel's sep uh, if you assume your kernel is additive, or if you assume it's separable, it's it's relatively straightforward to address. Um, although I should say that uh, for the separable kernel, it's it's something like log n to the d, so it's going to scale exponentially in the dim uh, dimensionality of the data. Right. So one reason we care about this gap um, is that we it tells us something about hyperparameter selection. So in particular, if the worst case uh, from our bound um, at the, the best possible setting of hyperparameters is better than the best case, which would just be the full marginal likelihood at some other choice of kernel hyperparameters, then we, we know we can't really be in that, uh, in that worst place in, in hyperparameter space. So here I've just plotted that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that I can calculate the 
likelihood everywhere, which or the full marginal likelihood everywhere, which um, isn't really the case for large data sets that we care about, but, but at least this is what's happening kind of theoretically. And you can see that as we increase M, we end up very close to the uh, true optimal hyperparameters. Um, right, so in conclusion, we were able to show kind of that sparse variational inference uh, converges even when we use many fewer inducing features um, than the amount of data. And, and we can do this to get a kind of precise probabilistic bound and also kind of this nice asymptotic scaling. So a few things we're looking at is if anything can be said about non-conjugate variational inference um, and whether any of the methods we use can instead uh, be used to say something about standard inducing points. And also it would be nice to have kind of uh, some, some understanding of how tight these, these bounds are and whether log n is really the right number of features. Uh, right, so thank you. So we can take a couple questions. Uh, so this is, I mean, in some ways, it seems like kind of an amazing result. Um, do you have a sense for how large n needs to be for it to be kind of reasonable? Um. So we do have a, like an exact probabilistic bound which says like with probability greater than. Uh, okay, I, I'm not going to get it right. Just just saying it. Um, in practice, some of the constants are, are a bit large, but but I, I think not terribly large. Um, I guess it depends how confident you want to be and how small exactly you want it. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, so I have a question. Um, so it looks like so you only prove for the square exponential because the nice property of the eigen. So, how easy is it to extend this to, for example, other different kernel versions? Right. So we kind of so in order to actually the a lot of the theoretical analysis with these eigenvalues kind of carries over, but you can't actually write down what the eigenvalues would be or the eigenfunctions. So to actually get uh, get some sort of result which you could use in practice is is pretty difficult. Um, maybe for some return kernels it would be doable, but in, in the convergence would be much lower than we'd get out of something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think in general it would be difficult. Okay. Um, more questions? Okay. Let's thank, thank the speaker again. Okay.